guys welcome back to the channel so this is another one of my series of homage videos and uh, I decided this time to take a look at some of the old games workshop Warhammer army books now everybody I think if you follow games workshop know that there used to be a version of Warhammer that was called the old world at least it's called the old world now but uh, when they would do the game, each of the armies or the factions would have their own book issued. And so if you played them, this book kind of told you what units you could buy. Uh, sometimes it told you how many units you could have in each army. It told you everything they did, their special characters and stuff. And so these were just always, always used to look forward to the new army book coming out. Uh, and there was a lot more than this. Uh, now, I don't play Age of Sigmar, so I don't know if they still do army books or not. So I can't comment on that. But uh, this is probably one of the things I miss most about GW and the old world. Because even, if, even after I had stopped playing uh, Games Workshop, I would still buy these books. Like, I think the last, the last few that I bought... I, I hadn't really played GW Warhammer in a while, but the books were so chock full of history and lore uh, and just pictures and art that kind of gave you, you know, an image of medieval or high renaissance times that you could buy it and you could even use these, you know, these ideals in other games. So that being said, what I have out here are two different... Uh, years for some of the same armies and these were actually my favorite years this these here and then these here anything that came in between and there i think there was several different books in between because they didn't do them every year but uh i either didn't get or i got it and i just got rid of it later on but i've held on to these for a long time so these came out if we look at the copyright uh, I think I had saw this before. 1993. So all of these here would have been around 1993, maybe 94, depending on when they would release them, because they would kind of come out one after the other. And then these, I think, are 2003, I want to say, is what I saw the copyright say. This one says 2000. So basically, these are seven years apart, and it really gives you a good idea of kind of how the, the how the magazine changed, and well, not the magazine, but the publication changed, and then of course, obviously, they eventually got rid of them altogether. So I think the first thing I want to do is just give you a flip through of one of the 1993 issues, and then we will do a flip through of the same same army. For 2000 and then maybe I will do one more flip through of, of another faction so let's get started all right so the first one I want to flip through is the Warhammer armies the Empire for 1993 and so the magazine opens with and this is this is interesting so up here you have a scene of a town being attacked right in the old world and then down here you have a model or playing this scene out so this scene here in the art is being played out here on the table right so that's real cool so it will begin where you have a table of contents where you get the history of the empire the land and this would be like the geography of the empire special rules and war machines Empire Tactics, Coloring Section, which you would use for painting, the Empire Army, so this is the detachments in the Empire Army, and then the Army List. And then you would get special characters, Emperor Karl Franz, Magnus the Pius, Ludwig Swartzheim, Grant Theogenes Volkmar, and on and on. So when we start, we get the Land of Sigmar, which if you guys play Age of Sigmar, that should sound familiar to you. 
Uh, let's see here. Uh, the passing of Sigmar. Sigmar ruled the empire for over 50 years. During this time, the rough villages blossomed into small towns. The people multiplied and many new settlements were founded. Of course, there were still enemies to fight. Marauding goblins continued to cross over the world's head mountains and there were plenty of savage human tribes in the northern forest beyond. See, I don't know if they ever modeled the savage human tribes. I know they did chaos, but I don't know if they ever did this army who these savage human tribes were. I would have liked to have seen some models of them because they remind me of uh, who are the ones in uh, Lord of the Rings the Rohirrim had to face. Was it the, Dunling, the Dunlings? So I would have liked to have seen those. Of Sigmar's reign, very little is known. For the dwarf Anos are concerned chiefly with their own affairs and Sigmar's pardon them. All that is known for certain is that Sigmar eventually put aside his crown and journeyed eastward, suppos supposedly to Karaz Akarak to meet his old friend Kurgan Armbeard. So again, that is kind of another homage to Lord of the Rings where basically their Sigmar of their Aragorn is going to, you know, Moriah or whatever, one of the mountains, uh, dwarven strongholds to see, you know, Gimli or whoever. If he ever arrived at that most famous of all dwarf holds, the dwarf records do not tell. The time of Sigmar passed and he became a legend, the heroic forebear of his people. Temples and shrines were built to his memory and the cult grew up to venerate him as founder of the empire. And then they say within a generation he was worshipped as a god with his own priesthood and theogenes and so forth. So uh, now it's funny because they say he took his place alongside the chief old gods of the empire, Tall, Ulrich, and more. But you don't hear about any of them in Age of Sigmar. So I wonder what happened to them. That's kind of funny. But anyway, so they go on and talk about the age of the elector counts. We have some maps here of the old world geography. And it was always cool because some of these lands, they, would, uh, they had troops and the colors that the troops wore there. So then again, all of this is just history, important events in the empire. The land of the empire, the geography, Altdorf. And of course, the empire is modeled off of uh, Germany or the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, so then we get right into the machines, which is kind of odd. Before they even get the troops, they have you talking about the machines. So they have this, and they had a model for almost all of this. So you have this uh, empire steam tank, and then you had this empire war wagon. Right, and I have both of these models, so I'm gonna actually do a separate video homage to some of my old GW models, and I will let you guys see those. I have both of those, and they're painted. My only regret is I wish I would have had more, like a little regiment of them, because I would have loved to have about three of these, three of these war wagons. I don't know what they go for nowadays if you can find them, but it's probably nothing I could afford. And this is the old steam tank. This was re redesigned and I think we will see that so then you see the war wagon the rules on the war wagon which is real cool so man I would love to play that again I would love to play somebody trying to go after a war wagon I, I forgot about that the hell blaster volley gun I think I had that although I don't know where it's at it's probably maybe it's still in my collection that was cool halfling hot pot I never got the halfling hot pot the mortar yeah, they all have mortars. Usually got a mortar with some of the box games. The great cannon, same thing with the cannon. I used to like these rules because they'd have to bounce. You don't see that in a lot of rules no more. Summary of cannon fire. Man, I almost want to play a game with this. Because I always did. I did house rule my Warhammer uh, rules, but they were always good. I mean, you didn't need to house rule them that much. So you get the Imperial Steam Tank, and this is this kind of an article, like a White Dwarf article. This kind of talks about how to, how you fire your tank. And then here's, of course, a color model of it. That was, that was how it looked. I don't know if I painted mine exactly like that. 
These were the Elector Counts, Empire Outriders of the Blazing Sun. These guys were so cool. I used to love them miniatures. Ha-ha, the Empire War Wagon. Now, I did paint mine just like that. And the crew. So the crew was armed to the teeth. Right? They were armed to the teeth. Now, I think they got the War Wagons from the Teutonic Knights. Uh, if you read about them in history. But uh, they had... The repeating musket, the long rifle, the blunderbuss, that's like a shotgun, the hook halberd, the, uh, what it says, with, with ball and chain, and the man catcher. So they could deal with a variety of threats from that war wagon. This is the uh, Imperial War Altar. I never had one of those. Uh... The Elector Counts. Now, these are the Elector Counts. At one time, I had all of these. I do not know how many I still have, but I, I it was my goal to get all of the mighty Elector Counts. So, you have the Hockland, Averland, Middenland. He was my favorite. Oslin. This guy looks like the uh, kids left. Uh, the, um, from the College of Magic, the Reichsguard Knights, Swartzhelm. He was one of my favorites. And then the battle standard bearer. Halfling hot pot. I don't think I ever got the halfling hot pot. Maybe I did. I don't remember. If I got it, it would have been later. I don't. I know I didn't buy it when it came out. And then so here you had a knight to the white wolf. I love these guys. And I think this is who the space marine, the space wolves chapter was based on. Meaning they were supposed to be like the future version of the knights of the white wolf. This was your kids left wing Lancers. So I had these. I think I still have a unit of them. Of the kids left wing. Like the Ice Queen of kids left. I think I had her. Your right guard Knights. So the Empire. And then the Panthers. They were one of my favorite units. The Grand Master of the Knight Panthers. They were one of my favorite units. These two were my favorite. The Panthers. And the white was. I didn't even know they had these little colored banners in here. Look at those. You could really photocopy those and cut those out, which I definitely, I may do that. I may put a thing in here and do those banners are so cool. I didn't even remember that. So then they had a, a wizard's tower. This was your paint scheme. This is just kind of a brief synopsis of the different soldiers the army the Empire could bring to bear. So the Empire could bring any type of soldier for any type of situation, which made it so powerful. And so they just give you some more specifics. Then you get into your army list. So the maximum number of magic items that you could equip with each of these regiments, wounds, equipment lists. So you'd pay for, if you wanted them to be with a sword or a flail or whatever, your characters, your regiments, and so forth. So all of this is army list, special characters. I mean, this was real detailed. Well, people, you could put together some lists if you really wanted to think about it. Although what you normally saw was a very powerful leader with a very powerful magic weapon that would kind of run around the board, uh changing the tides of battle affecting any any little battle here or there just enough to until you could rout your enemy but uh you could house rule some of that these were the wizards the battle wizards i used to like these guys the gray wizard was always my favorite and so these are this is what it looked like when you bought them these were the literally the metal miniatures the metal miniatures I, I'm really looking forward to seeing how they're going to bring these back if they are. I mean, I've, I've heard, I've had people comment on my videos saying that when the old world comes back, it's just going to be like some kind of limited Forge World, uh, Forge, Forge World uh, box game or something. Like, it's not going to be an actual return. And that would be sad. I would, that would be unfortunate. I'm not going to say I wouldn't buy it, <laughs> But it would be unfortunate, but I mean, because you can only get so much in a box. Like, you can't bring all this back in just one box. But I don't know, maybe they'll, they'll sell stuff through their little, little, they'll release stuff a little bit at a time. All right, let's take a look now 
We're going to fast forward from 1993 to 2000. Okay, so by the time we got to 2000, I think the guys at GW, for whatever reason, really wanted the game to be a little more serious. Meaning, they wanted the game to kind of play like a traditional war game. They wanted the feel to be like real and traditional units. And so what we're going to see when we go through the 2000 issue is how everything is uh, realized. Meaning they might still have a steam tank, but they're going to make it look much more real. So the, the items in here go from looking kind of cartoonish and comical, like we saw in the 93 issue, and they begin to look more like something Leonardo da Vinci would have created. So we open here, and you can just tell from the art, the whole tone has changed, right? The whole tone has changed. And once again, we have some armies on display, but this time it's not, they're not trying to match the art with the uh, models. You just have basically the Empire facing some of their, you know, their most hated foes, the Orcs and the Skaven on the bottom. But so you see the art, and I love this art. I don't care what anybody says. This stuff was stone cold art. I think this was done by Adrian, uh, what is his name? I can't remember his last name. I don't know if they give him credit. But I think it was done by uh, Adrian, ba 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 so the cover was David Gallagher. That's here. That's okay. That looks like an Osprey plate. But what was the interior art done? Adrian Smith. That's who I'm thinking about. Now, you have a lot of people in, in GW that they're, they're a lot of John Blanche guys, right? They love John Blanche. I'm an Adrian Smith guy, okay? So I'm not going to say that you're either John Blanche or Adrian Smith, but I'm an Adrian Smith guy, period. Blanche's stuff is way too dark for me. I just don't like it. Adrian Smith, it just he just hits every tone, right? You see this image here. Adrian Smith wrote a book called uh, a game. I think the game was called Leviathan or something like that. But he did the art in that. And, you know, he brought that same grit and that same style uh to this as well. Now, I don't know which one he did first. I think he did Leviathan first. And I used to have it. Maybe I'll pull it out for you guys if I can dig it out. But you will see that same... It just has a sullen strength to it. I mean, this, this art just is just amazing. I mean, this is just amazing. So let's get right into it. But you can already tell it's a more serious tone. So we have here, Lessons of the Empire. And it says, excerpt from a lecture to Comrade Ludenhoff by his preceptor Erasmus von Nohn. Now see, I haven't read that. I would actually like to read that. I would actually like to read that. Soldiers of the Empire. So in a way, they do, they do not go into the history unless they put it in the back. So they have Chronicles of the Empire. But they do not, they skip a lot of the history of the empire. So I'm assuming that they, they assume you have that from a lot of the old books. But as you can see now, instead of starting with heroes and what magic weapons they can get, remember? And how many you can have, like, you know, like it's a, like it's a, a, a toy or, or, you know, or accessory. They're going straight into militias and state troops, right? So these are your militias. Which this is what a militia would be is archers, crossbowmen, free companies. This is what your state troops would be. They go into the new detachment rules, meaning if you were going to have detachments to parent companies, they deal with flanking. They deal here with pistoliers and great swords. Again, you look at the plate. This is a straight up version of an Osprey plate right there, with the numbers. And the identifications and things, that's straight up what you would see in an Osprey magazine. You know, but obviously this isn't Osprey because there weren't any flagellants, you know, in the uh, Holy Roman Empire that I'm aware of. So we go from there, they go to, right into the knightly orders. Uh, they don't really list them. The Imperial Gunnery School. 
I mean, even the names have changed to just make this stuff sound stone cold real. The School of Engineers. Oh, look at the volley gun. Now I did. I do have that volley gun. I remember. I made a. I made a. Uh, I made a special effort to get that. The Warrior Priest, the Flagellants. They were always cool. I don't know if I have any more of my flagellants. I had some at once. The Empire Beastery, the Empire Armory, the Treasure Vault of Magic Items. So, I mean, this thing gets straight to business. I mean, this is just straight business. There's almost no fluff in between the beginning pages and when you hit the army list here with your elector count, your t captain, your warrior priest, master engineer, your core units. So I think this is the one where you had, when you put together an army, it told you, you could have so many core units, you could have so many detachments, you could have so many state troops, and so forth. So that when you built your army, you would take blocks of these troops and stick them in. Which not only made it easier and more fun, but it made the game much more realistic and more tactical and interesting. Painting the Empire Army. And then these are just some of the models. And you can tell the paint scheme has, has changed. They've got a lot darker tones in the paint scheme. You know, a lot darker colors to make them look a lot more serious. Right? To really look like these are some knights on parade. You can see the weapons. Have look at these volley guns. Look at that, boy. Now, what did you want? Would you even if you were a dragon? Would you want to put a dragon up against that? They've got two mortars, two cannons, and two volley guns. <laughs> yeah, baby, that's gonna deal out some. That's gonna deal out some damage. And then you see these guys here. I think these were like from the engineer school with the kind of specialist weapons. You know, the battle wizard. He even looks like an old biblical prophet or something. Bringing down the wrath of God on you. <laughs> oh, man. This stuff brings back so many memories. Oh, man. Oh, man. And then here's your cult of Sigmar. These flagellants. Those friggin' war hammers. Yeah. So, and then this is a huge army display. The army of the Elector Count of Talapine. They talk about the terrain. So gone is that kind of funny looking tower that they had for the wizard. And now you see these real kind of kind of clock towers that they got. Right? You don't see no more of those big round funny looking wizard towers. Luther Huss, Prophet of Sigmar. This was one of my favorite models. I do have him. Balthasar Gelt. I do not have him. Supreme Patriarch. Never got him. Okay, I have to read up on him. Chronicles of the Empire. So now they talk a little bit more about the Imperial Electors, the Rune Fangs. Which I think the Rune Fangs were a string of, uh, were they swords or mountains? And then some events in the history of our empire. So then this is just kind of a chronicle of the Colleges of Magic. The creation of the Colleges. Now, again, now this is obvious. You can tell that's a John Blanche picture right there. I don't even have to look for his signature. His, his signature is all over that. That looks just like something John Blanche would do. The land of the empire of the bleak mountains and high passes. So you can even see with the uh, writing here, that almost has like a Lord of the Rings type of script, right? Of grim and treacherous forests. Of the lie of the land, of the clear pastures and farmlands of our glorious empire. Man, this was wonderful. This stuff was wonderful. Hammer of Sigmar. This is a story. So, as, as game books go, you know, you get a lot less in, in 2000 than you got in 93. And you can just, you can see that by the thickness here. Right, you can see that this this one is is a lot lot thicker than what you got now, and that was another you know you were paying the same thing, but you were getting a lot less. But uh, this is actually much more of a war gamer's book. This is what you would expect from a war game, 
right? This is more what you would expect from, you know, a box game. You buy a box with some little man in it, some colorful toys, you know, and you want to play it. So you would get something like this. This here is just for, for straight up war gaming. You're going to build your army list. Here's what they can do. Here's how many you can get and so forth. So, uh... I'm not sure. In some ways, I think GW was trying to keep up with their audience by now. If you remember, GW came out in the 80s. By the time you get to 2000, if somebody was 16 in 1980, you know, by the time you get to the year 2000, that person's 36 years old. So, uh... Somebody's basically looking at that and saying, well, maybe, you know, this is what they, this is what a 36 year old would want. Whereas this was what, you know, you know, maybe a, a 17 or 19 year old would, would want. By 1993, if you were 16 and 80, I mean, you were still fairly old, but, you know, you could introduce this to your young brother or something. I don't know. Uh,. So that's what they looked at. I mean, that was a homage. I, I do want to flip through two more real quickly just because these are my favorite nationalities. And that is Britonia. Britonia was always my favorite. And so we're going to flip through this quick. This is the 1993 one. And you get a lot of background on the Britonians. The... Uh, what did they call that? The Border Princess was who the Bretonians had. Heraldry, Blazons. And again, you can see this is kind of designed very colorful, very fun looking. Right? The Knights Aaron. These guys were my favorite models when they did the Bucks and Knight Aaron's. Man, they were good models. The Knights. These, to this day, these are still my favorite Knights as far as miniatures go. I mean, I'm sorry. They they have just enough detail, but not too much. I mean, you can find much more detailed horses and knights, but if you're trying to paint and build an army of them, it's too much. This was just enough. This was just perfect. So then you have their liveries. You know, they have their shieldsmen, their wedge formation. That was like the most powerful thing for Bretonia. If you could get in that wedge formation, it was over for any of your opponents. They did the Green Knight from uh, the movie Excalibur, one of my favorite knights. But I always wish they would have did another model because they only did they only sold him mounted. They never did an unmounted version. And I always was waiting on them to come out with another one. So we can get through here the lore of Bretonia, the Grail Knights. Oh, I used to love the Grail Knights. The Knights Errant, the Knightly Virtues. I used to like those. Those were like their specialties. Rank bonuses, arrowheads. That's the stuff you would get from uh, using the wedge formation. Your rank bonuses and stuff. And then so, you know, they just get in here. This is all army list. All army list. The Green Knight. There was one, one character in here that they never did. I mean, they never did a model for. And I waited and I waited year after year after year saying, when are they going to do a model for him? And I think the character was uh, Roland Le Marchal, based on the song of Roland. And they never, ever did a version of, of Roland, Roland the Marshal. They never did it. Just never seen him. I think they did a Suleiman. Like I said, they did the Green Knight. I think they did Bertram. I think they did Tancred, but they never did Roland. And I waited every year. I thought this was going to be the year we'd see a model for Roland, who was one of my favorite, you know, uh, characters from, uh, you know, the, the, I guess you want to say them, the, the French myths, nightly myths, the song of Roland. And so then this was the uh, 2000 Bretonian. And again, you're going to see the same thing. Just beautiful artwork. Look at that. I mean, look at this, guys. I mean, if you looked at that and I still asked you what that was from, none of you would say immediately, oh, that's from GW. 
you know, you guys would look at that and say, well, you know, oh, yeah, that's got to be from a history book. You know, or maybe one of these French or Spanish miniature companies. No, guys, that's straight up GW. Look at these knights rolling out that castle. Look at that, man. Look at that host. Look at that host. So and that was the thing they did with the Bretonians, too. They took these boys to another level. Look at this. Look at that spread. They took these boys to another level. Look at this. Look at the beautiful thing. This is like the uh, bio tapestry. Look at that. I don't even think I, I went through this all the way. Look at this, man. Just look at the art. Can you guys see it? I hope you guys can appreciate this, man. This was love, man. People who put they they when they built these when they wrote these books, man, they put love behind these books. Right? This wasn't just about selling you some stuff, man. This was about this was about love, man. This person who did this, they loved the whole ideal of Bretonia, like a lot of us did. Look at all of these shields, man. Look at all of these. And at one point, they would have stickers or things with some of them you could get so that you could, like, have every one of these represented. And I don't think they ever had every one of them, but, man, that would be so cool. And then look at this. Just look at this host, man. This Bretonian war host. Oh, my goodness. Look at the color. This is King Lewin, Lewin Core. He was always one of my favorites. I liked him much better than Carl France and them. This is one of your, I think these were like your Grail Knights or Pegasus Knights as they were called. Duke Theodoric of Br Breton. Look at this guy. He looks like he should be part of the Empire Army. I mean, they just got banners and spears. Banners and spears. The Green Knight. The Lady of the Lake. One of these was like the Lady of the Lake. I think that one, no, she might have been either the Fey Enchantress or the Lady of the Lake. Both of them were very powerful in your army. Look at these guys, man. Look at this. Just page after page after page. So if you compare this to the 1993 one, which was good, but I mean, this one is just a, an art fest. Right, this was an art fest. So the Empire has flagellants. Britonia has pilgrims. The pilgrims, baby. Warrior pilgrims. You know, Bishop Heyman, you know, and all them type of characters. They had the uh, trebuchet. <laughs> I actually had that. I think I still got it. The mighty trebuchet. The bowmen, the heavy knights, yeah, the crusades and wars of errantry, the dead walk the lands, I haven't read that, land of despair, the rise of a new king, a tale of years, forming the lands, this was the lands formation, and so they changed it in this edition where you didn't have to actually do the wedge, you just had to line up nine knights like here. And that what that gave you the benefits of the lance formation. Look at this, the questing vow. The knight vow. Look at this, man. Look at this. Look at this kind of ragtag community, man. You guys got to be kidding me with that age of Sigmar. Get out of here. This was art, man. This was art, man. This was fable. This was lore. This was Lord, baby. This was Lord, the blessing of the lady. Look at my man. It's Knight Aaron who's come all so far to receive the blessing of the lady. Look at that, man. Come on. This was Lord, guys. I don't care what any of you say. You guys can hate on me all you want. I still love you. But this was Lord. Devoted of the goddess. I don't remember the goddess, whoever the goddess was, but... Ah... Uh, Grail Knights, Battle Pilgrims, and the Grail Reliquy. I remember the Grail Reliquy. Peasant Bowmen, the Royal Pegasus. And you need those Pegasus if you were fighting the Empire because you better fly down on top of those war machines and take out those cannons 
and volley guns, or you could be all the night you wanted to be. You know, you could put it in any wedge formations you wanted. If you didn't have them Pegasus to fly down and take out those volley guns and those cannons, you were going to be in it for a long day. Because the honor would not allow them to retreat. Look at this. The lady. Core units. And again. And so then we come to the end, guys. Oh, wow. Look at this. Look at that's the way to end it. A knight one on one. That looks like who is that? King Lu, Lu and Lewin Core versus a giant. It says, and with one final blow, his blade driven by his faith in the lady, Marcus of Bordelot slew the fell lord of the Norse, ending the battle that had raged for night and day atop the towering lighthouse of Languil. Woo! Hoo -hoo! Look at that. Look at that, guys. You guys got... Who doesn't want to play that out? I don't even think they did a, a guy named Marcus of Bordelot. I might have to make this miniature. And look at that Norse dude, man. He almost looks like a giant. I don't even remember whether they did the Norse. I don't remember if they ever did those miniatures. Wow. Wow, the Green Knight. The Green Knight. Crashing in and his power on his steed. I wish they would have did another model of him. They never did another model of the Green Knight. I would have loved to have gotten a better model of the Green The Fey Enchantress. Look at that. Look at that. She looks kind of scary. Oh, King Lewin Lewincor. They threw that down in front of his uh, throne. He's showing them what is, I guess that's what's invaded the land. It looks like a minotaur's head or something. Wow. And that's it, guys. That is my homage to the Game Workshop Army books. So let me know what you guys think. You know. <clears throat> Do you miss it? Do you miss it? Take care everybody. God bless.